We've taken the time to look at the first 30 NES games as well as the final 30 NES games, but someone a while back, specifically Farmcat8484, mentioned, next give us a list of the 30 middle NES games. Well, as much as I hate to do it, I'm going to. Why? Because this is a unique chance to drop in the action of a system in its full swing, a portal into understanding where the system was going once it was established, and I love that idea. Here's the problem. I need to do something to figure this out, something that starts with M and ends in TH, has a vowel in the second slot. Can you guess what it is? That's right! Math! Some of you were thinking about meth. Meth is bad for you. Now I'm notoriously bad at math, but I do recall how to calculate the median of data points. We have 675 licensed releases on the NES, and because our list starts at one, we add one of the total elements divided by two, which equals 338, that's our middle index. A uh, little bit of uh, number crunching. Uh, okay, so games 323 to 352. Those will be the games that we care about. That being said, let's take a look at the middle 30 NES games. Well, this game is a branded game, and it goes by a different name in Japan. Apparently, Michael Andretti didn't have shit on Satoru Nakajima, at least not in the F1 racing world at the time. By the way, this is an F1 racing game featuring, you guessed it, Michael Andretti, who looks like he really needs to take a shit. Like, just go, bro. You don't need to ask for permission. I won't tell the teacher. The game itself is fairly decent from what we would expect from a racing game of the era. The only complaint I have is that the screen is half map, half action whereas other games like Rad Racer would actually let us see a realistic portion of the map. I know they wanted to focus on the idea of heavy simulation, and that plays into the difficulty of it. Honestly, I would say give it a shake. Looks fairly decent for what it is. Oh boy, Toze. Now this company is one that is incredibly hit or miss, and more often than not, they miss. For example, Pinball Quest seems pretty simple, right? Well, no. Pinball Quest has pinball, that's the obvious part of this. What the not so obvious aspect of this game is, the quest part. You see, this is a game that is the result of somebody smoking something that smells like a Midwest road trip and saying, let's combine pinball and RPGs. Now, while it isn't a fully fledged RPG, it does have an RPG mode. And we go through six levels trying to rescue the princess from the bad guy. This is a strange one. Some might like it, some might not, but hey, if ever there was a time to try to make a new idea stick, it was the third generation of gaming. Long before Antonio Banderas was voicing the more well-known Puss in Boots from Shrek, it was a story, a fairy tale from the 1500s, and the character has almost always remained the same, a goofy cat that uses his skills to trick people and get rich doing it. Now this game in particular isn't based on the story, and obviously it isn't based on Shrek, but instead it's based on a Japanese movie, The Wonderful World of Puss in Boots from 1969. And the main character is Pero, a play on Paral, the original author of the Puss in Boots story. Cool little tribute if you ask me. But the game itself is a platformer, like most film IPs tended to be, and the whole gimmick of it is that you need to travel the world in 80 days. Remember the Jules Verne book? That's the principle of this game. Meaning, you have 80 days in-game to circumnavigate the Earth, and every minute is one day. So you have 80 minutes to beat it, because if you don't go around the world in 80 days, you lose no matter what. This is Square's answer to Rad Racer, which is actually a pretty fun game for what it is, but the problem to me is that Rad Racer 2 is essentially the same game, the only big changes involved scenery, if that makes sense. It's a little bit more difficult, the checkpoints can be more gnarly, and it's significantly easier to spin out. In fact, bumping any other car or hitting an object will cause a spin out. The AI in this game is mean, and if you've ever beaten Rad Racer like I have, you know that the AI is out to get you. Everything you know about Rad Racer, multiply that AI's behavior by at least 10. The AI is a sentient goon ass that will 100% crash into you on purpose. If you enjoyed Rad Racer, then I think you might enjoy Rad Racer too. Just don't expect much in the quality of life improvements department. Ever heard of Cinemaware? Seems like a silly name for a game company. Well, they released tons of novelty games, many of which were questionable in the what level of bullshit am I willing to put up with today aspect of your daily life. The only games I know off the top of my head that they did were Defenders of the Crown and Lords of the Rising Sun, both of which can be considered shit. They can be shit. But one of the big things that Cinemaware did 
was to make their Amiga games portable to the NES, and I'm shocked that they got away with it. Because this game is basically a ripoff of The Rocketeer, which if you've watched my previous episodes, you know I'm not a big fan of it, at least from when I was checking out movie games. We play as The Rocketeer... <laughs> My bad. The Rocket Ranger, going up against the Nazis, trying to prevent them from obtaining Lunarium, a mineral that exists on the moon that has the ability to lower the IQ of human males. It's actually a part of the game. I think this might be a cult classic if you were into Amiga games, but I would pass on the NES port. It seems really watered down from what it was. Did anyone play this? Let me know down below. Real-time strategy games based on the Sengoku period seem to be the bread and butter of a few companies. Koei in particular was a massive fan of it. And for good reason. It was a well-defined historical period of war, so why not capitalize on it? Hot B felt the same way and released Shingen the Ruler, which in my opinion has one of the coolest box arts I've seen for the NES. I even mentioned it on the top 10 NES box arts episode, which I'll link down below in the description and at the end of the video. The game itself is a massive simulation mixed with strategy and resource management, and because of that, it's incredibly time consuming. Building your empire to take on the other provenances and become the most powerful daimyo of the Sengoku era isn't easy, and you'll find that difficulty can be hard to stomach. If these kind of games are your kind of jam, then feel free to check it out. You might actually like it. Silkworm is a strange name for a pretty straightforward game. This is a horizontal shooter, and as far as I know, it has nothing to do with silkworms and everything to do with helicopters blasting the shit out of anything and everything that comes its way. This is actually an early Tecmo arcade game, 1988 to be exact, an era that was defined by Sega's Afterburner, Konami's Gradius II, Irem's R-Type, and Toa Plan's Twin Cobra. So in my humble opinion for what it's worth, this just didn't make the impact that was needed to compete against the Powerhouse 8. In the game, we can either be in a Jeep that shoots missiles or a helicopter, or if you have two players, you can have one of each. But as a kid of the 90s, you know that the argument of, no, I want to be player one, it's my house, probably happened a little bit with Silkworm. I want to be the helicopter. No, you were the helicopter last time. Hey, Solstice. Now this is one that I know of, the predecessor to Equinox, and likely the inspiration for the Immortal. Solstice is an isometric nightmare that occurs after the absolute bop of a menu song thanks to Tim Fallen! Every list needs Tim. Tim is forever! Can't evade him. He's like the Tooth Fairy except he leaves little tasty proto-rock jams under your pillow instead of money. In the game we play as the Jack Diesel Mage wizard guy Shadax and our objective is to rescue Eleanor from the evil Morbius. And to do that we need to reassemble the staff of Demnos. That's the ultimate end goal, but good luck getting there. Solstice is a fiend. In fact, when I do play this game, I'm gonna listen to the entire title theme to its completion. And nobody can stop me. I'm an adult. I pay my own bills. This is an interesting game, and believe it or not, it starts with Tecmo, but back then they went by Tekhan. The game that they made was Star Force, and that inspired Hudson Soft to create Star Soldier. Starship Hector is the follow up to that game, and it's a vertical shooter. Now to me, the make or break, or even the aspect that draws you into a good, solid vertical shooter is the presence of badass power-ups, but guess what? You'll never get any power-ups. The entire length of the game, you have your base weapon, and that's kind of a letdown. Gradius, R-Type, they all had these legendary power-ups that let you decimate your enemies, but not Starship Hector. I will say the game is approachable without those power-ups that we would expect, but it's still fun. It's a challenge, and I don't mind challenges. I don't think you would either. Certainly one of the most interesting spins on the RPG genre as a whole, Wall Street Kid has us being the enemy of the modern middle class populace. A stockbroker. Our whole objective is to turn half a million dollars into a million dollars to make sure that we can secure an inheritance that surpasses the current net worth of Jeff Bezos. Now what's interesting about this game is that all of the stocks and the behaviors of the stock market in the 90s are all accurate, right? The names of the stocks and the companies are changed slightly, but at the end of the day, I've actually wanted to really dig into this because me and my wife are financially independent. That's why I'm able to work on these videos every single day. We were smart with our money and we live in our forever home. So maybe I can test my prowess with this game or maybe have my wife play it with me. Wink, wink. 
Well, you might not recognize this show if you're a younger member of my audience, but if you were alive in the 60s or even the 90s, you know of Gilligan's Island. The whole principle of the show is that a three hour tour turned into a really fucking bad time. And that bad time lasted for three seasons on two different networks. In the game, we play as Captain Grumby, he's known as the Skipper, who was portrayed by the late Alan Hale Jr. And we're followed around by the total goofus who is Gilligan, portrayed by the late Bob Denver. And our whole job is to make it through four episodes while contending with Gilligan getting in perpetually bad situations, which is a running joke on the show. So having it in the game format, Kind of makes sense. This game taught me chess. I don't know how to explain it. I never played it on the physical NES, but I did check it out on an emulator. And while some people might not like it, I did. Imagine regular chess, but the pieces are sentient and have little mini battles when attempting to take another piece. It's kind of cool in theory, but the only complaint I have is that the NES version is kind of slow. But this game was on damn near every single computer. Hell, it was even on the Acorn Archimedes in the late 80s. That's not something we talk about often. As a game though, it is important because for a long time, Interplay relied on EA to get their titles out. This marked a landmark for Interplay because it was the first game they developed and published on their own, effectively breaking their dependency on Electronic Arts. There were a lot of faddish things in the 90s, TV shows, films, dinosaur nuggets, Taco Bell cups, and most importantly, monster trucks. To date, I have never seen a monster truck event live, but if you grew up in the 90s, you knew what Bigfoot was. And no, it wasn't a hairy man. That's what your parents thought Bigfoot was. Bigfoot to a vast majority of the kids of the 90s was a souped up F-250 that still to this day exists in the Monster Jam lineage. I was more impartial to Gravedigger though, just seemed more edgy. Now because Bigfoot was such a popular monster truck, there was a game created. And guess who did it? Acclaim. Because between LGN, Ocean, and Acclaim, someone was bound to pick it up. The game itself has a few different events, like a top-down race, a side-profile car crunch, or even a dragging minigame. Because nothing makes grown-ass men happier than seeing a truck pull something a few inches. <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. Circus Caper is a game. It's a game that many people look past because it's not great. And it's created by a company that should have been in the plant business to replace all the oxygen that they wasted. Circus Caper is based on an anime, Moeru Onisan, which I can't really tell you much about because I'm not well versed in Japanese literature. But what I can say is that this game involves the main character rescuing his sister from a dragon. Wanna guess what the name of the dragon is? Dragon. Yeah. That's a thing. Now when the game was ported to the NES, they yanked all of the anime references out and instead they made it all about the circus. Hell yeah, kids love the circus. So should they love this? No, people didn't like it. One of the most critically underrated games on the NES, Crystallis is a SNK game that many people often consider to be one of the most definitive examples of a quality action RPG on the NES. And it is, it's a solid game. In Crystallis, we play as a young man who wakes up in a post-apocalyptic world. This world is interesting. It's the result of someone hitting the reset button on society as we know it. So it takes place in the medieval setting, but the year is 2097. Yeah, so everything we knew as a society, technology, and science, it's all been lost. And instead, magic has filled the gap, which I find to be interesting. The only post-apocalyptic game I've enjoyed was Fallout. So to me, SNK had a unique perspective. Ooh, a Natsume game, more specifically, an RPG. This one's a lot like Dungeon Master or Eye of the Beholder, more of a dungeon crawler. It has us randomly going through towns trying to find work, you know, usual RPG things, but it's rough. This game basically takes the norms and tropes of RPGs and makes them about 500 times more complicated than they need to be. Instead of just learning magic, we need to combine runes from different elements to create our own spells, of which there are 243 different ones. And it's completely up to the player on how they want to progress. You can create a spell that lets you fly, lets you breathe underwater, shoot you up into the clouds. You never know what you're going to create. Also, fun fact, basically any status effect that acts against you in this game is straight up murder. If you get poisoned, just hit the reset button. It's not worth it. I think for the first time ever, I'm calling out Natsume for having a rough game, and that's a first. 
You know, we have tons of baseball games on the NES, but this is softball, if we sprinkle just a little bit of imagination into it. In traditional baseball games, say Jaleco's Bases Loaded or SNK's Baseball Stars, you tend to play as simulated folks that actually play baseball. But in this one, all of the characters have their own unique gimmicks, right? It's a lofty, fun, different spin on softball, and our whole objective is just to beat everyone working our way up to the Amazons, a team of hypersexually frustrated Amazon women. There are like 60 people that you can form teams from. Choose Diablo though, he has a spiked bat. Or Mike Tyson, he's, a, he's got an arm and he likes to hit the ball, even if his back is broken. Final. Out of all of the games that were present in the middle lifespan of the NES, to me, this is the most important. And if we were to compare it to all of the other games, I believe this one blew them all out of the water. Final Fantasy was the answer to the competitor Enix and their quality JRPG, Dragon Warrior. And between those two franchises, they've paved a path for the future of JRPGs that to this day maintain the elements that were found in these wonderful games. Final Fantasy is a simple game. We go around as four different Warriors of Light, of which we choose their class, and while it might seem straightforward at first, there is a plot that involves an endless loop of time with the big bad guy, and I don't want to spoil it. So I do encourage you to check it out at your leisure. It's rewarding to go back and check out all these games in the order that they're created because it shows us how franchises evolved throughout time, and this is a fun one. I know I mentioned Baseball Stars, it was made by SNK, and if you've played Baseball Stars, then the footage you're seeing right here might look familiar because in 1990, and only for the North American regions, SNK decided to use the same engine to cover Little League Baseball. Which, if you ask me, it's a pretty niche demographic, but it's still fun to think about. There are 16 teams you can play as, and I can't complain. I enjoyed Baseball Stars for what it is, and this is just the kid version of it. Give it a shake if you want to. Well, we're in that era of LJN, ocean and more importantly, Mindscape grabbing up film licenses to make subpar video games, and Mad Max is smack dab in the middle of the buffoonery. I tried to play it for the 10 best NES movie games episode, and yeah, it's not good. There's a few things going on with this one too. For some weird reason it's called Mad Max, but the game is based on Mad Max 2. Also, this is not an original game at all. You see, Grey Matter made this game with Eastridge technology, but instead of making a new game, they decided to rehash a lesser known and lesser successful game known as Road Raider, which was on the PCs of the era. So what they effectively tried to do was remake a shitty game, and prayed to the gods above that by slapping on a Mad Max sticker that the game would work, and it didn't. More often than not, you'll just drive around getting lambasted by anything and everything, and you're dead within the first five minutes. If you were a kid of the 90s, there were some games that your parents would rope you into playing, and if you were like me, you had zero interest in it. So those same games ended up being in the attic or in the coat closet collecting dust because your family lacks both artistic ability and common sense. Some games that come to mind are Life, Trivial Pursuit, and Pictionary. Now, Pictionary is basically a game where you have to draw things, but for whatever reason, LGN decided to allocate the funds to create a rather shit version of Pictionary for the NES. Want to guess who they asked to develop it? Why none other than Software Creations, which means <laughs> Who's there? Tim motherfucking Fallens! Yeah, so uh, Tim did the music for this one. And it's just Pictionary, Tim. Jesus, it's Pictionary! The game itself is mostly you doing atrocious mini games, and every time you score, the image on the right is drawn a little bit more. And then you can guess it, and then you can win the game. That's it, it's a short game. <laughs> You know, I was wondering when Rare would end up on this list. 1990, that's when. This is Snake, Rattle, and Roll, a cult classic NES game that involves you playing as Rattle or Roll, making your way through 11 isometric levels while dodging enemies and trying to eat nibbly pibblies, which add more mass to your snake. The reason we want to do that is because in order to progress, we need to weigh a specific amount to open a door. This is a game that's been on my radar for a while, and I've been interested in checking it out. Many of you in the comments have held it in high regards, and it's working. The peer pressure is at an all-time high. Also, fun fact, the music in this game was composed by David Wise. He's a great composer, and his work on the Donkey Kong Country trilogy all but defined the ambiance of that game. So if you want to see some of his earlier work with Rare, you'll find it here. When you think of the roots of RPG video games, there tend to be two games mentioned, Ultima and Wizardry as these two games set the standard for what an RPG could be. Prior to that, we had mainframe computer games, small throwaway derivatives, and ultimately pen and paper RPGs that people played at a table. 
Wizardry is important. It took the world by storm and more importantly, it influenced the Japanese market heavily. Without wizardry, we might not have had Final Fantasy. Or maybe people would have figured it out in their own time and maybe the direction of the industry would be slightly different. Now, wizardry came in a few different flavors. The NES version, it's pretty faithful to the PC version. I personally played it on the PS1 because it was a definitive format. But basically, we control six different characters and bring them through the 10 level maze with the intention of taking out Wordna. Or if you're me, you teleport them away, taking advantage of the game's programming. I can't vouch for the NES version, but the game itself is incredible for what it is. This is a nifty little game, Barker Bill's Trick Shooting, a zapper title that has tons of little mini-games. In fact, there are five unique mini-games, and while they aren't life-changing, they are fun. In Balloon Saloon, we shoot balloons while avoiding shooting a dog, it's kinda like Duck Hunt. In Flying Saucers, we shoot plates that Bill and his assistant throw. Then we have Window Panes, where we need to hit objects but sometimes the windows close and obscure our shots. Must be made of good glass. Props to anyone who's watched the stream and understands that reference. The final two levels fall under Fun Follies, and the whole idea is that we go through the first three stages, and then we take on two more challenge stages. It's a good game. I don't see myself playing it for years, but for a little while I think it would be fun. Dick Tracy has a rich history. It started as a comic strip, and as time went on, it entered mainstream popularity, specifically in the 50s. And one thing that I've always found interesting was that this was the era of goofy-ass gangsters, right? Like Flat Top C, or The Mumbler, or 88 Keys, How About Odds On, or Little Face. <laughs> if you ever get a chance, read some of the older comics by Chester Gould. They aren't that bad. Now, unfortunately, when you have a legacy comic, it opens the floodgates for other ideas to manifest such as a movie in 1990 starring Warren Beatty. And because there was a movie, there was a game. Scratch that. Games. Plural. The NES one is the one we care about, but there were other games on the Genesis, Master System, and gaming computers of the era. Now, to me, the NES game gets a bad rap, because in terms of content, there's really not much there. We go from point A to point B while dodging a Fallujah level of snipers just to go on a fetch quest of information, eventually leading to the arrest of someone who committed a crime. It is very mediocre, but I don't find it bad. I don't know, maybe I'm the weird one here. You know, I've never actually played NARC, but based on the comments some of you have left on my videos, the majority consensus is that this game broke your hearts, and I don't know why. I've seen it often in arcades, but I've never taken the time to play it. From what I've read, it's a run and gun game and it started in the arcades. It was made by Eugene Jarvis, which if ever there was a name of someone that you should know in the gaming industry, specifically the arcade industry, it's him. He's responsible for Robotron 2084, Cruisin' Defender, you know, the good era of Williams Entertainment. And after all of that, he ended up creating his own company, Raw Thrills, which is epic because those games still occupy modern arcades. But NARC itself, from what I've seen in the arcades, doesn't look bad, but something tells me the NES port from Rare was underwhelming and kind of stupid. The whole idea of NARC involves drugs, it's kind of in the title of, you know, NARC, and per Nintendo's policies, drugs aren't allowed, so I don't know why they even bothered to port it. But let's ask the community, what do you think of NARC? This should be interesting. RPGs were stupid popular in the 90s, and you could thank Dungeons and & Dragons and numerous other fantasy campaigns for keeping that idea afloat. Swords and Serpents was one of those fantasy RPGs that graced our facial processing units, and for many people this was a straightforward and approachable dungeon crawler, one that you could play with your friends, which is massive. If you had an NES satellite, you could have up to four people playing the game with you. You could huddle around a TV with your friends and take on Interplay's vision, and then proceed to write down one of the worst passwords known to mankind. And this was an era long before mobile phones or save states. If you messed up that password, you had some apologies to hand out like candy to your friends. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. That's how long it probably took Interplay to develop this one. And it feels like it. I talk often about Ocean and LJN, but Acclaim was just as guilty as those two when it came to trying to make lights and stuff work. And to me, they never did. In 1990, they took Total Recall and attempted to make a NES game out of it. And I played it for a little bit, but it ended up being shot like 400 times and kidnapped three times. It wasn't fun at all. There are more versions of this game, specifically on computers of the era, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Something tells me it just wasn't done right. Oh boy, 
Oh boy! <laughs> There aren't many times where I say this game is one of the worst things to ever come out since Battlefield Earth, right? This is one of those moments where this game is one of the worst things to come out since Battlefield Earth. In fact, I'd rather play tag with a rabid fox than ever pop this game back in an emulator. It's that bad. Now the first Back to the Future game, it was rough, playable, but rough. This game is a mistake. Beam Software put this out and I don't think they took the time to, you know, actually watch any of the movies because they messed up. Nothing makes sense. It's slippery. It's just a really bad game. And thankfully it's spot 29, so I can at least cleanse my palate with something that isn't butthole. If you do care, we go through what Beam Software interprets as the events of Back to the Future 2 and 3 all the while wondering if Beam decided to just rip off the Goonies too, because in some ways it feels like that. Oh well. So often we talk about the creators of Activision, you know, David Crane, Bob Whitehead, Alan Miller, and Larry Kaplan. But one of the big contributors outside of those four guys was a dude named Gary Kitchen, who left Activision and created his own company, Absolute Entertainment. You know it's a running gag in the game industry to create a company that is alphabetically before the company that you left. From Atari came Activision and Accolade, and from Activision came Absolute. I'd love to make a video describing the family tree of these video game companies and how they interconnect. If this is something that you'd like to see, please don't hesitate to let me know, I'd love to do it. But back to the game, Battle Tank is the last game on this list, and it's awfully similar to Battlezone from Atari. I'm surprised there wasn't a lawsuit. The games are very similar, the exception is that we kind of have a plot, right? There are missions that we need to accomplish, whereas the Atari iteration was just non-stop tanking action. We sit in a tank, we blow shit up, no more really needs to be said. And those are the middle 30 games on the NES. I actually enjoyed this. I feel like it could be the capstone to our Every Video Game Ever episodes when we cover the first and final 30 games for a system. It gives us that insight into how a system was functioning, the ambition, and in some cases, the greed of the companies that were out there. What did you think of this one? Did you ever play any of these games when you were growing up? I'd love to know down below, and I know the community would as well. Speaking of our community, if you made it to the end of this episode, you're already home with us. We're a group of individuals who love remembering a time when life was just a little bit easier to live, and I'd love for you to be a part of our collective memories. Finally, the single most important thing you could do for me is to hit that thumbs up button as it directly impacts the visibility of the videos and the projects that I work on every single day. As always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes, fortify your out.